please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Welcome back. Get ready to work harder. That seems to be the message from various regulators. First, it was SEBI allowing longer trading hours for derivatives. And now, uh, sources are telling Money Control that SEBI and the Reserve Bank would be looking at longer trading hours for the currency market for Forex. Tarun Sharma joins in with the details on this story. Tarun, what news do you have for us? SEBI uh, is planning to increase the uh, currency derivative market from closing time from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, that was in 2016 also, but that... Okay, Tarun, I think we've got you on a bad line. Let's just try and reconnect that particular line with Tarun about uh, the extension or the possible extension of the Forex market up to 8 p.m. vis-a-vis the closing of 5 p.m. that it currently enjoys. So we'll get back to Tarun and uh, talk about that. But uh, in the interim, we have Rahul Singh, managing partner at Ampersand Capital, who joins in to discuss the fundamentals of the market. Uh, Rahul, hi, thank you very much for joining in. Well, uh, it seems as though we're now consolidating a little bit around 10,700, but we have a big queue with the Karnataka elections coming up. Uh, your sense in terms of how important it would be from a market perspective and how much of it is probably factored in? Yeah, hi. Uh, I think the uh, importance is uh, is there. Uh, it can't be underestimated. I mean, if you look at even uh, what happened after the Gujarat election results in mid-December, uh, although it was a much clearer kind of path to victory for the ruling party there, uh, even then the market reacted positively to uh, what happened in Gujarat, even though the margin of victory was not that high. Uh, so I think the uh, th this election is probably more important than uh, Gujarat because a lot has happened since then um, in, in, in the political uh, arena. So to that extent, I think it's an important trigger for the market. I think if it's, uh, I think what the market is factoring in or uh, kind of fact making it uh, making it in at this point of time is kind of a hung verdict, but uh, uh, probably BJP is still forming a government with some kind of uh, external support. So that seems to be the scenario which the market is already factoring in because mm -hmm. even though there is nervousness, the market has rallied uh, in the last uh, two, three weeks. So it is, we, you know, we can't really say that market is, uh, uh, you know, factoring in uh, and kind of an adverse scenario and there could be too much of a positive surprise. Uh, so to to my mind, I think it will be a, a minor rally if if this scenario actually plays out. Uh, unless we see a big positive verdict, uh, I don't see market rallying a big time uh, from the current levels uh, on 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 Karnataka elections. Rahul, I want to ask you about the converse. What if the bear case scenario plays out, and uh, you know, if one assumes that the BJP uh, is not able to form the government? then what sort of a market hit are we talking about and is it going to be sort of passing sentiment or does it sort of change the nature of this uh, this rally well in that scenario it won't be a passing sentiment for sure because we have more elections coming up uh, later this year in in the states and then the the really the noise level and the crescendo towards uh, 2019 election starts to build up and uh, people start to get uh, factor that in in their risk assessment of various stocks and sectors so it won't be a passing sentiment for sure in in the bear case scenario uh, also you have to remember that in addition to that uh, we have had a weakening of macro in the last uh, mm -hmm. A uh, couple of uh, months, or maybe a month, when oil prices have gone up. So, really, you have to uh, you have to look at this market uh, in 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 context of that also. Mm. And the market has kind of ignored it uh, for uh, for some time now. And if if that kind of a verdict comes with oil price being where they are, uh, you know, you could you could have a a pretty decent correction. Okay. Even in terms of, say, the best case scenario from a market perspective with regards to the Karnataka elections, Rahul, um, if we do see Brent crude move higher, say, towards the mid-80s and start sustainably averaging around that level for the rest of the year, then do you think that the markets will sit up and take notice of Brent crude? That's an interesting question, and that is where we are, actually. If you look at the market... Uh, 
uh, what is really happening is that uh, the currency is obviously depreciating but it has not yet reached a situation where we are running you know huge twin deficits so it could go into a tailspin scenario like what happened in september 2013 mm. so we are far away from that scenario uh, also what happens when currency depreciates is that it leads into a vicious cycle of FII selling and market mm. going down and then further selling uh, and it goes into a tailspin kind of a scenario. Uh, this time what is happening is that although there has been FII selling relentless, uh, it has been completely balanced by the uh, domestic uh, wall of money. And therefore, uh, you know, there is there is some sense of a you know uneasy equilibrium which is there in the market today. And therefore, if Brent continues to go up slowly and gradually, I think uh, we will live through that scenario. Although individual sectors will have to see because earnings in some parts of the market will get hit, uh, but it won't be a uh, you know a dramatic uh, dramatically panic kind of a situation because we have money waiting in the wings. Uh, the huge uh, domestic uh, wall of money, as I mentioned. Hmm. Okay, so in this uh, macro backdrop, uh, what uh, is the portfolio stance now, Rahul? Since we are talking about these headwinds. Uh, what is it that you would prefer and what would you leave out? Well, I think uh, we are uh, obviously advising investors and for our own fund, we are having a mix of uh, defensive as well as uh, names where we think there could be uh, higher returns. So uh, one will have to play uh, a balancing act here in terms of the kind of portfolio we run. You will have to have some... Um, you know, value picks where you can safely predict a 15-20% kind of a return, uh, which essentially means higher quality names, large cap names uh, in sectors which have uh, tailwinds. And also, uh, you know, uh, include some of the mid caps names. So we, in our portfolio, for example, we'll not obviously go overboard on mid caps in this kind of a scenario. Mm. And in the mid caps, so the space we like is uh, basically in the construction auto ancillary space where we have been bullish and uh, that is the space we like. But as I said, we, you know, obviously in this kind of a market, we'll have to have uh, uh, more large caps in it, uh, in sectors and in with valuations which can deliver us uh, kind of a reasonable return. So that the risk adjusted return for the portfolio, uh, even if it it when it's five ten percent lower than what we were happy with six months back, I think uh, one will have to live with that. Okay, a quick la have to live with that. Okay, a quick last question from me then, uh, Rahul. You have quite a weight, strong weightage on uh, consumers within your portfolio. Can you just tell us which are these stocks or you know specific themes that you're looking at and are you probably looking at increasing your weightage there? What is your stance on it? Uh, no, we have uh, already quite a high weightage mm -hmm. on consumer. And as I mentioned, the segments uh, or the stocks we like are uh, stocks like Page Industries, we like Blue Star, uh, we like Havel. So, a mix of um, mix of uh, consumption and mass kind of market products as well as white goods is something which we have been positive on. Okay, I also see Mastec uh, in your top holdings. I don't know if you still hold that stock or not. Which brings me to Midcap IT. I mean, stocks have rallied, uh, and wherever there was even a slight disappointment in numbers, uh, elevated expectations, uh, we saw stocks get beaten down this season. How are you looking at uh, some of these names? Yeah, some of the names uh, went really crazy uh, in terms of the valuation. So, what we uh, what we are seeing is basically that uh, these stocks were underowned. So there has obviously been a frenzy, and not all companies have delivered. I mean, some companies have delivered, like an IIT Tech, but there have been disappointments too in this segment. Uh, so I think the um, I think the way to play it is to try and identify stocks uh, and Master being one of them, which are not very heavily owned uh, where there is a new management uh, there is attraction in terms of the uh, business momentum and the valuations are not as expensive or more expensive than the large cap so in some of the mid caps the valuations went up to as much as you know the large cap valuation which really is is something one has to question um, so at this moment if you were to you know if you were to ask me to pick a name in mid cap it will be very difficult to uh, you know uh, add add further to the exposure which we already have 
Okay, all right, Rahul, we're going to get to a CNBC TV 18 exclusive now. The GSTN board has initiated a process to acquire stake held by other companies. Timsi Jaipuria joins in with the exclusive details to break down what this news means. Timsi, hi, over to you. Yes, as you rightly mentioned, GSTN board has initiated the process to acquire stake held by other companies, which is 51% stake. Remember, GST Council had agreed to convert GSTN into a public entity, which will cost uh, around 5.1 crores to both centre and state as they acquire this stake. Also, the current, this is as per the current uh, authorised share capital of GSTN, which is about 10 crores, uh, which is divided in 1 crore equity share of rupees 10 each. And the restructured GSTN board, as per the proposal mentioned by the GST Council and approved by the Council, is to the, the board will have 13 directors. GSTN board will be inducting four directors, each from state and centre, and the board will have three independent directors also. On the other hand, when it comes to the employees, GSTN staff will continue to be working for five years on the contract basis on the current salary. But post uh, this uh, conversion, GSTN hiring will be done only with the permission of GST Council, which means very crucial that any time uh, any employee can be uh, hired, but only after GST Council's approval. And the uh, the CBIC and state governments will bear the cost of GSTN operations through these user charges that they earn. So let me tell you, this entire process will now take about a month's time. And let's see how soon this uh, proposal gets forward. Because post it, the final nod has to be of cabinet. They need to move to cabinet to convert GSTN from a private entity to a public entity. Let's wait and watch what happens. Okay. All right, Timsi. Thank you for getting us those details. Well, now let's try and get back to that money control story that we were discussing. Uh, the possibility that SEBI as well as RBI could look at extend the trading hours for the currency market, for the forex market. Let's try and reconnect with Tarun. Uh, Tarun, can you hear us now? What exactly are you picking up on this? Yes. Uh, what we are we are getting from our sources that SEBI is exploring the option of extending the closing time from 5 p.m. to 8 for currency derivative and uh, I, I, I'm just mentioning to our viewers that it is almost a decade old demand from the exchanges that currency derivative timing should be uh, should be aligned with the foreign markets because if you know if, if you if you see that four exchanges in the world where uh, rupee uh, the rupee dollar uh, context trade after 5 p.m., the volume has increased drastically when the Indian market closes. So that's why they are planning to uh, they are planning to increase the timing from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. And one more demand exchange is uh, in in front of SEBI that uh, the opening timing will also. Uh, increase so they can align with the Singapore exchange. So what we are getting this RBI is also convinced now that uh, the currency derivative timing should be increased. And the, earlier that was the problem of the bank union because the bank should be open till 8 o'clock for the issues. So now they are planning to increase the uh, closing time from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. Okay, all right, Tarun. Uh, thanks very much for joining in. So maybe there could be an extension in terms of the opening hours as well. That's what Tarun mentioned. So uh, let's see whether this takes place or not. Decade-old demand by the exchanges. Volumes picking up post 5 p.m. It's still quiet as far as the index uh, goes, just about uh, 14, 15 points up on the Nifty. It's the mid-caps where there is a fair bit of unwinding taking place. But the uh, story that's going to be grabbing attention today in terms of the uh, the corporate setup is definitely what is going to happen at that Fortis board meeting. The day is finally here, Ekta. So help us refresh our memories because there are so many suitors with you know, different bid points. Some are paying up front, some are paying later. So just uh, take it away. Well, I don't think I have that much time <laughs> for a detailed uh, analysis on it. So I'll just surprise our viewers of what exactly is going to happen today. The board meet is going to consider the expert advisory committee bids today. So that means the expert advisory committee that consists of two members, that is Deepak Kapoor and Lalit Bhaseen, are going to give what they think would be the best bid. Now remember that Stancy has been a financial advisor to this. We have Upwood, which was the second financial advisor, plus we have a legal advisor uh, from Cyrus uh, uh, Amarchand Mangaldas as well, uh, Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas as well. So there's a lot of independent valuation which has come through with regards to these four non uh, four binding bids. Now remember that the four binding bids come in from Manipal TPG, Munjal Berman, IHH, 
Radiant and KKR. Uh, Manipal TPG, remember, along with Munjal Berman, do not have any due diligence which uh, they have put in terms of a term. They're saying that it is completely irrelevant of uh, due diligence. We have IHH and Radiant KKR, which have said that yes, there will be an upfront payment that will be based, uh, that will be completely uh, binding, mm -hmm. but the rest partial amount of uh, what they've offered is going to be based on due diligence. Okay, let's see what uh, the uh, board makes of it, what the committee recommends and whether the board can come to a decision today itself. On that note, we have to wrap up this edition of Trading Hour. Stay tuned. Halftime Report coming up next.